want you all to meet Frank Johnson. He's one of the best electrical servicemen around these parts. Hi, man. Glad to have you eavesdrop on this session with tech. And this is Harold Rossio. He's no slouch in electrical work, either. Just call me Hal. Hope you all get as much out of this session as I expect to. I understand Frank has some new electrical information that'll help all of us. Let's start with this new multi-circuit connector. It seems to me that multi-connectors should be a good break-in point for troubleshooting. Only trouble is, trying to figure out where all these wires go from this circuit diagram is kind of slow work. Those service manual circuit diagrams are mighty valuable, Hal. They give you all the circuits for all models. However, you'll find the simplified circuit diagrams in this new tech reference book will give you a better understanding of how that multi-circuit connector fits into the major electrical circuits. Man, I can read that diagram without my bifocals. You better keep your reading glasses handy, Hal. Service manual diagrams are handy for checking color codes, wire size, and continuity for all circuits. Now, let's see if I can clear up a few basic facts about this multi-circuit connector. This section at the left is in the backup lamp circuit on manual transmission cars only. On air-conditioned cars, the lower part of the connector is in the compressor clutch circuit. At the upper right is the engine wiring harness connector. What circuits does that include? The ignition, start and run circuits, the oil and temperature gauge circuits, and the horn switch circuit. Now that's the kind of information I've been looking for. How about these connectors in the middle with all the heavy wires? That center section carries the main feed circuits to and from the passenger compartment. Specifically, the one at the left is the battery connection. The one in the middle is in the feed line to the circuit breakers for heavy accessories. The one at the right completes the alternator charging circuit. I hope you're going to cover those circuits in detail. We'll get on to individual circuit details as soon as I explain what the remaining two connectors do. This one at the lower left carries the starter circuit connections. The one that's left must be for headlights, huh? Yep, right you are, Hal. Frank will give you the details. From left to right. Right turn and stop lamp. Parking lamps. High beam headlights. Left turn and stop lamp. Low beam headlights below. I suppose those unused receptacles are for some of the less common special electrical equipment. Exactly, Hal. Let's see if I can remember what each of these connectors are for. Don't bother, Hal. Every terminal in the multi-circuit connector is clearly identified in this reference book illustration. Good. Now, if I just knew where each of these terminals tied into each of the basic circuits, electrical troubleshooting on these 62 models would be a cinch. That's exactly what those reference book diagrams do for you, Hal. This charging circuit diagram is a good place to start. It shows how the alternator, battery, starter, and ignition circuits are tied into the multi-circuit connector. Incidentally, alternators are optional in Canada and standard on Canadian imports from U.S. production. I didn't realize that, Tech. So let's see if I can trace this charging circuit. Alternator output goes to the alternator terminal of the multi-connector, through the ammeter, back to the battery terminal of the multi-connector. From there... The engine wiring harness carries the circuit to the battery terminal of the starter relay, then to the battery terminal of the starter. The starting motor cable completes the circuit to the positive battery terminal. Let me see if the alternator field circuit is that easy to follow. From alternator field terminal to regulator field terminal, from regulator ignition terminal to the ignition switch side of the ballast resistor, then to the ignition run terminal of the multi-connector. Inside the car, the lead from the multi-connector ignition run terminal goes to the ignition switch run terminal. Say, tracing these simplified diagrams is duck soup. I don't know about the duck soup, but I'm sure of this. I've seen a lot of alternators and regulators replaced because of high resistance in the alternator field circuit. I don't doubt it, Tech. Suppose Hal and I tell you how we check out charging system trouble. Good idea, Frank. The quick review should do us all a lot of good. To begin with, a fully charged battery is a must. Don't guess. Test the specific gravity of the battery. To measure the field circuit voltage drop, 
Turn on the ignition before connecting the voltmeter. The negative voltmeter lead goes to the field terminal. Positive lead to the positive battery terminal. Connecting the voltmeter with ignition off would put full battery voltage through the voltmeter. Another tip, be sure and disconnect the leads at one end of the ballast resistor. Tech's right. You'd get a false voltage drop rating if current was flowing through the ballast resistor and ignition coil. Total voltage drop in the field circuit should not be more than three-tenths of a volt. If you get more than that, make a point-to-point -point test of the entire circuit. Check the voltage drop at every terminal and connection between the field terminal of the regulator and the positive battery terminal. Be sure to check the drop between the cable and the battery terminal. The trouble could be high resistance in the battery cable connection. Once you're sure the field circuit resistance is okay, test alternator charging circuit resistance. Disconnect the battery ground cable before you connect test instruments. Now here's a warning. Don't pull the battery connector instead of disconnecting the battery ground cable. If that battery lead is accidentally grounded, you'll get fireworks and burn wires. I'll remember that, Tech. Now for the charging circuit resistance test. Disconnect the wire from the alternator output terminal, then connect the ammeter in series between the disconnected wire and the output terminal. Connect the positive voltmeter lead to the output wire terminal and negative voltmeter lead to the positive battery terminal. Remove the alternator to regulator field wire. Connect the jumper wire between the field and output terminals of the alternator. Before you reconnect the battery, check every test connection to make sure nothing is accidentally grounded. At this point, I always check field current draw. The ammeter should register no less than two and four tenths, or no more than two and eight tenths amperes. A field current draw of less than two and four tenths amperes indicates high resistance inside the alternator. You'd suspect brushes, slip rings, or field coil connections. A reading of more than two and eight tenths amperes means shorted field coils. If field current draw is okay, you can go ahead with a charging circuit resistance test. Start the engine and adjust engine speed until the test ammeter reads 10 amperes. Maximum voltage drop should be three tenths of a volt. If it's higher, make a point-to-point -point voltage drop test across each connection. Will someone turn the record so we can hear what Frank has to say about the current output test? The current output test tells you whether or not the alternator is delivering rated output. The field jumper removes field regulation, so you're testing alternator output at a specific engine speed. For this test, move the voltmeter lead from the positive battery post to a good ground. Also, connect a carbon pile rheostat across the battery so you can adjust load. Start the engine and adjust speed to exactly 1250 RPM. Then, adjust the carbon pile rheostat to get a voltmeter reading of 15 volts. Rated output is not the same for all alternators. Always check the test specifications for the one you're working on. And disconnect or turn off that carbon pile load as soon as you finish the test. Glad you reminded me, Tech. Now, if the alternator passes the output test, you go on to the regulator test. If it fails the output test, there's internal trouble and the alternator will have to be removed for further tests and repair. If the charging system passes the field circuit resistance test, field current draw test, charging circuit resistance test, and alternator output test, you can be sure the trouble is in the regulator. Be sure and cover the regulator tests. Okay, Tech. Here's the test instrument hookup. Remove the field jumper, and reconnect the regulator field wire to the alternator field terminal. The ammeters connected in series and the voltmeters connected across the charging circuit. Start the engine and adjust speed to 1250. Turn on lights or accessories to get a 15 amp reading on the test ammeter. Be sure the system is run long enough to normalize alternator and regulator temperatures. 15 minutes at 15 amps will take care of temperature normalizing. 
voltage will vary from about 13 and one half to about 14 and one half, depending on regulator temperature. Now, take regulator temperature about two inches from the regulator cover and check voltage registered against the specs in the service manual. Next, turn off all lights and accessories and increase engine speed to 2200. Watch the voltmeter and ammeter. Voltage should increase at least two tenths, but not more than seven tenths. And the ammeter should read a maximum of five amps. If the voltage reading at 1250 RPM is outside of specifications, or if voltage increases less than two tenths, or more than seven tenths when engine speed is increased to 2200, the regulator's out of adjustment. Before you make any regulator adjustments, make sure the fusible wires are okay and securely soldered. Right now, let's hear what Frank and Hal have to say about some of the other circuits. The reference book covers stoplight, turn signal, instrument, starting and ignition circuits. What'll we cover first? Well, there's too much to cover in this film session. How about uh, going over the starter and ignition circuits? I'll buy that, Tech. Starting, ignition, and charging circuit problems are the bread and butter part of the electrical service business. Okay. Let's have a look at this simplified ignition circuit diagram. The feed circuit from the battery goes to the battery terminal of the starter to the battery terminal of the starter relay, then to the battery terminal of the multi-connector. That's where the circuit disappears into the passenger compartment, and I have trouble tracing it. Well, let's see if you can trace it on this diagram. Okay. From multi-connector to ammeter, from the other side of the ammeter to the ignition switch battery terminal. Let's see. There's an ignition run lead and an ignition start lead out of the switch and back to the multi-connector. The ignition start circuit goes to the engine harness connector and then to the output side of the ballast resistor, to the ignition coil, then to the ignition distributor. The ignition run circuit goes to a different terminal of the multi-connector, then to the input side of the ballast resistor. The run circuit goes through the ballast resistor to ignition coil, then to the ignition distributor. How about letting our buddies out there take a look at the complete ignition circuit diagram? Don't you men out there agree that this kind of diagram will help you locate ignition circuit troubles? Well, I didn't hear any objections from the audience, Frank. So why don't you pass out a few tips on testing the ignition circuit? I'd like to cover two basic ignition tests I use on every hard starting or performance complaint. Good ignition begins with good primary voltage to the ignition coil. A voltage test while cranking will show you whether or not the voltage to the coil is high enough for good starting ignition. To make this test, connect a jumper to the distributor side of the ignition coil to ground out the primary circuit. This will keep the engine from starting while you're testing. Connect the voltmeter positive lead to the input side of the ignition coil. That's the coil terminal marked plus. Ground the voltmeter negative lead. Crank the engine for about 15 seconds and watch the voltmeter. If cranking voltage is nine and six tenths volts or higher, ignition starting circuit resistance is okay. If it's lower and you're sure the battery tests okay, check for high resistance. Make a systematic point-by-point point check of every connection in the ignition start circuit. Now, you take it from there, Frank. Okay, Tech. I always test for high resistance at the distributor end of the primary circuit. Just remove the jumper and connect the voltmeter positive lead to the negative coil terminal. With the ignition turned on and the distributor points closed, voltage drop should not be more than one-tenth of a volt. If the voltage drop is more than that, the trouble is in the distributor lead or the ignition points. What's on your mind, Al? Those two tests don't tell you anything about resistance in the ignition run circuit. That part of the circuit between the ignition switch side of the ballast resistor and the switch itself. 
On any performance complaint, I'd sure check out the voltage drop in the ignition run part of the circuit. I'd also test the ballast resistor. That's exactly what you should do, Al. And the drop from the resistor to the battery terminal of the switch shouldn't be more than one-tenth of a volt. Now, here's a simplified starting circuit. Al, can you give us a few tips on checking this circuit without reading the whole circuit terminal by terminal, please? Sure thing, Tech. Here it is, short and sweet. There are two basic types of cranking trouble. If the battery is okay, but the starter doesn't even grunt, test the control circuit from the starter solenoid terminal to the ignition switch. And on torque flight cars, check the neutral safety switch. It completes the relay circuit. You're stealing my lines, Tech. If the battery is okay, but cranking speed is slow, check voltage drop while cranking. To do this, connect the jumper to the ground side of the ignition coil so the engine won't start when it's cranked. Connect the positive voltmeter lead to the positive battery post. The negative lead to the starter battery terminal. Crank the engine and watch the voltmeter. If the voltage drop is more than two-tenths of a volt, check the drop across the cable and connections. Maximum voltage drop across the cable should not be more than two-tenths of a volt. There should be no voltage drop at the terminals and connections. If the drop from battery to starter is less than two-tenths of a volt, the trouble is in the cranking motor, and it should be removed for inspection and bench tests. Did I cover that fast enough, Tech? You timed it just right, Al. I don't want to blow the whistle on this session without mentioning this turn signal circuit diagram. Have either of you used it yet? I haven't used it, but I've studied that circuit diagram and read the reference book explanation of how it works. For the first time... I have a clear-cut understanding of where every one of those six turn signal switch leads go and why. Say, this is interesting, Tech. Suppose I trace out all the circuits for you. Flasher, canceling switch, indicator lamp, the whole works. If you do, you'll be talking to yourself, because we're fast running out of record. And speaking of records, this session winds up my 14th year of working with you and with master technicians all over the world. That's the best service training record in automotive history. But more important than that, the fact that you men are out there listening proves you are interested in good service. The customer keeping end of the business. <laughs> <laughs>